so I'm going to start with a story. So the rector of a parish, perhaps in Vermont, decides that God is calling the parish to a new vision of what it should be and do. So at the next vestry meeting, he presents the new vision with as much energy, conviction, and passion that he can muster. And when he finished and sat down, the senior warden called for a vote. All 12 vestry members voted against the new vision, with only the rector voting for it. Well, Father, it looks like you'll have to think again, says the senior warden. Um, would you like to close the meeting in prayer? So the rector stands up, raises his hand to heaven, and says, Lord, will you not show these people that this is not my vision, but your vision? And at that moment, the clouds darken and thunder rolls, and a streak of lightning bursts through the window and strikes into the table at which they are sitting, throwing the rector and every vestry member to the floor. After a moment's silence, they all get up and dust themselves off. The senior warden speaks again. Well then, that's 12 votes to two. <laughs> So now that I have your attention, there's really no reason for that story. I just like it. <laughs> and I always like to start with a little humor. Um, my, as Tom said, my name's Gay Jennings, and um, I'm delighted to be with you this weekend and for this particular workshop. This workshop combines two things that I care about. One is vocation, our vocational lives, both lay and clergy. Um, for 17 years, I was canon of the ordinary in the Diocese of Ohio, which was kind of like a life sentence, but it was a long time, two bishops, almost three, but I just decided I couldn't do a third bishop. So it wasn't you, of course. So. <laughs> and then for nine years, I was the associate director of Credo. I worked there with Thad, and we did conferences for both clergy and lay employees much of it about vocation. So that's my interest in vocation. And then resilience, um, for nearly 25 years, I was a ski patroller, National Ski Patrol. We actually do have uh, hills in Ohio. <laughs> They're small hills, but we had 18,000 school kids a week in a learned, uh, learned a ski um, school program. And so through that, I got interested in what we call, you may have heard of, critical incident stress debriefing for emergency service workers like patrollers, but also EMTs and police. And those are, it's really stress education and debriefings for first responders having normal reactions to abnormal situations in their line of work. So if we had a death, on the hill at Ski Patrol, we would have a debriefing of those patrollers that worked that, uh, that accident scene. So that's why I'm interested in the two of those. And so I've worked over the years in how to combine them. And so, um, so that's what we're going to talk about and explore. So the first thing I want to do with you is to explore the landscape of your vocations as lay people, as deacons. I think there's a bunch of deacons in this diocese, right? Great. Um, priests and bishops, and we'll take a relatively brief look at the forces, trends, and energies that shape our vocations. That's smiling because I developed this exercise for Credo, which they now, actually, I think they still use, right? Yeah, yeah? okay, well that's good. Just want to give credit where credit's due. Um, and in terms of our vocational landscapes and some of those forces and energies, some of them we have control over and many of them we don't. And so the landscape is both complex and it's ambiguous. Um, then we'll spend some time thinking a little bit about our own respective vocations. And I'll be speaking from the perspective that everyone sitting here is a leader. Every single person, both lay and ordained, you are leaders in 
the diocese and in your local worshiping communities. And finally, we'll look a little bit at vocational resilience, which is how, how do we bounce back in times of transition or loss or um, big change? Uh, how, and how do we successfully adapt to change. My mother says the only person who likes change is a wet baby. And she was a good Episcopalian. So, but, but our life is about change, uh, whether we acknowledge that or not. So I like word studies, and I like looking at the root meaning of words. And the word landscape was um, originally a Dutch word, landschap. And it was first used in the late 1500s by Dutch painters to refer to a type of painting. Are there any art historians here? Oh, good. <laughs> so if I screw this up, let me know, OK? But anyways, it, it, Dutch painters used that word to refer to the type of painting which depicted a physical environment. And soon after, the actual word uh, came to mean the environment which was portrayed in these paintings and landscape designers started to design the landscape to actually match the paintings uh, to fit the visions of these original paintings. And so landscapes come to mean a climate or um, an atmosphere which serves as the background for for human action, for, for human life. Um, or, as somebody said, a space with a degree of permanence with its own distinct character, either topographical or cultural, uh, and above all, a space shared by a group of people. So, so what are the forces? Um, what are the trends? What are the energies? What are the realities that form the backdrop for your vocations as leaders in the church? They can be cultural, they can be global, they can be social, economic, ecclesiastical, and just, we're gonna do this popcorn style where you pop up and, and, and we're gonna brainstorm together. So what are some of, what, what's the landscape? Here, yes. Okay, and what I'm going to ask you to do is stand up, actually, so that we can all hear you better. So, can you do that again? Thank you. Okay, that's part of your landscape. What else? And, and that's relatively new and becoming, I think, more intense. What else? What's the landscape? Okay, so, so the landscape is that if you all get together, it's because you really want to be there, right? But it also means some people don't come. It takes an effort. It takes an effort. What else? Think about the landscape of your vocation as an ordained person or a lay leader. Think about the diocese, your congregation, the, the whole, ch whole Episcopal Church. Yes? Multi-faceted, multi-dimensional, multi 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 it's not, it's, not, it's not the way it used to be in terms of one, one size fits all. Everything is so... Damn hurried. Everything's hurried. So damn hurried, actually. Yes. Every family has its own weather system and culture. Ah. Can you say more about that? No. <laughs> you must be from Vermont. Um, <laughs> we didn't, we didn't hear. S stand up and say what you said again, because they couldn't hear it. Say every family seems to have its own weather system and culture. OK. What else? Jane, we live uh, among the unchurched. So there's unchurched as well as those that come to our churches. Okay. And the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, are growing. 
And I think the estimate is that one in five adults check none, N-O-N-E, for religion. And I think it's double that for people 30 and under. Yes? Some of the best conversations I've had are at the town dump, the post office, and the local store. Yeah. OK. Okay. It's hard to hear? Okay. All right, who else? We are a state that has the oldest population, except for Maine, so that there are more older Vermonters than younger ones, so that the aging of the population affects what we can do. Okay. You're getting into it now. All right. So what else? Landscape. Here's one. Um, the, I think that the, um, the poverty that is sometimes obvious and sometimes not so obvious in Vermont and in our country is really symptomatic of a society that's really seriously in trouble. So that's something that is pretty obvious in Brown. Okay. Here's one. Well, what, right there. Okay. Then, um, yeah. For us in South Burlington, the Parks and Rec program, which is an awesome program, but it has taken all of our children from us so that um, we find it difficult to minister to them. Okay. Um, we are small congregations that feel like we're always in transition. Why is the bishop laughing? <laughs> we are a society of great abundance, a good portion of which go to waste. Anyone else? Here's one. Oh, no, you were just. <laughs> you have to make one up. We'd like to say hi to each other. <laughs> More women work now. In fact, all of us tend to work now. I'm sorry. Yeah. Is this thing working? Okay. Um, women work now. Women have jobs, which cuts down on volunteering possibilities. We live in a very distracted society. There's many th other things that can take our attention. TV, internet. Being a newcomer, I've discovered that we're dealing in Vermont with a major issue with opiates and heroin, which affects us all. We're from St. John's in Essex, New York, and we're a very small congregation, and I think and I are the youngest ones, almost. So what we do, that we've connected with the All Saints Boys Choir in Dorchester, Boston, and give them like a long Adirondack weekend. So this is one way that we're trying to change our landscape, reaching out and grabbing these kids. Thank you. I do uh, delegate Episcopal Pastoral Oversight to St. John's Essex and to uh, um, Sarah Lake in St. Louis. So that's why they're with us. I'm, a New I'm, I'm an upstater too, upstate New Yorker. <laughs> no, she's waving. You, you're just trying to see if I would run that fast. <laughs> I think you have a future as a game show. Got kind of, got of <laughs> In regard to, to the people who check none, I am becoming increasingly aware of the fact that when I talk to people like that, they're not necessarily opposed to what my shtick is. They don't have a clue what I'm talking about. So different language, no translation. And uh, people from Vermont, they are, tend to be a little shy about singing their own song. 
there's incredible ministry at a local level going on in, right. from people in this room, a lot around food and feeding, and we'll feature that later. But So sometimes we're a little hesitant. Oh, but Philip is not. After the list of sorrows, which we all have personally and express together here, I can't think of a place in this world where we have more opportunity for people to learn to be good and happy than the state of Vermont and the diocese of Vermont. <laughs> I didn't plant him because usually when we when I do this exercise about the landscape, it is about complex and some difficult and sometimes intractable kinds of issues and problems. And so now, and actually, I was about to switch the gear, but you helped me do that. What well, what's the joyful part of the landscape that you lead and minister in? And you've started, but let's let's hear. And and Bishop Tom said a few things, but I want to hear from the rest of you. We do have a tremendous sense of community uh, all around the state, and we can accomplish some extraordinary things. And it's a real partnership between faith communities and secular organizations, whether it's blood drives or food drives or, or disaster relief. Because we're so small, there's a tremendous sense of accountability for each other, whether people see that as religiously motivated or not. Um, here at the, <clears throat> at the cathedral, a strong, growing, vibrant youth program with lots of kids singing in Sunday school. One little eight-year-old came up to me and said, can you believe my soccer coach has soccer on Sunday morning? <laughs> There's another uh, person from across the lake uh, from St. John's Essex. We, we both benefit and suffer from our isolation and the great strength of our little tiny church in Essex, New York, has always been a very strong sense of community that we then share with our other surrounding small communities. So we, we live in a time warp over there, but it's a very, very powerful program that we have going with God's help. Even though I spoke about how old the whole population of Vermont is. The blessings for us in, in Brattleboro, and I think it's happening in other uh, uh, congregations, is that we have reached across the generations. You're going to be seeing this afternoon one of the results of our children's uh, choir school. Great. And because of that, people who don't have grandchildren in the area begin to connect across the generations in a very good way. Right next to you. I know I spoke before too. That's Two right. things that make me think about Vermont, and it, it has to do partly with the change of the seasons. I mean, different things happen all year long because of the seasons, and most people are, you know, they dread the snow, but there's all kinds of things going on that they enjoy. So, you know, we get people that go to Florida instead of staying, but the seasons are one thing. The other thing at, at our church, um, between being a Eucharistic minister or being a Eucharistic visitor, being able to get out into the community and bring communion is just a very precious gift. I will pass it down. Um, again, it's that multi, multi thing that um, because uh, we're ministering in multiple areas and there's overlapping circles. Um, the network widens and we have more opportunities to engage people in different arenas. Okay. On a similar vein, uh, because we are small, we have the opportunity to be more aware of the social injustices and opportunities to engage in social justice and reconciliation uh, because it is an intimate community. This has been touched on by others, but as a Vermonter by choice, <laughs> and I, I moved here after we retired, <laughs> um, 
and from a long way away. <laughs> North Dakota, Oregon. <laughs> we have a fabulous um, outdoor background, and it's a real advantage. I think we've got one more, and then right up front. I think it's very important for churches in Vermont to really promote Rock Point Summer Camp for, for the children in our churches. They're our future, and then we need to be looking at that. Go grow it. Thank you very much for, for sharing all of that. Uh, I'm always, uh, I love doing this exercise to find out not only what the challenges are in your particular context, but also what are the joys, and clearly you have both. Um, I believe that a critical part of the vocational landscape and the life of the Episcopal Church, and frankly in other mainline denominations, is this. In the last five decades, there's been a loss of denominational loyalty coupled with empowerment of the laity. And so the religious landscape, because of that, is very fluid and it's characterized by, I, I would uh, call it a lessening of enduring ties to a denominational structure or an identity. How many of you were born Episcopalians? Whoa, that's a lot. <laughs> Man. And how many, how many are Episcopalians by, by um, I, I want to say by choice, but even those of you who were born into it are still by choice. But who, who were, you were something else? So it's about half and half. It's usually about two thirds were something else and one third. So you have a higher percentage. Um, so, so clergy and laity, um, and, and this is, uh, I wish I thought of this all myself, this is really from um, a, a, a sociology of religion uh, professor by the name of Robert Wuthno. What, what he says is that because of this, clergy and laity live in a world uh, in which the laity simultaneously have more power and responsibility, good thing, but less investment and loyalty to the institution over which they have more control. Interesting, huh? Um, it's, it's not intended to be a judgment on clergy or laity. Um, it, it's an observation of an enormous shift away from clergy as centrally positioned, and of course that's happened here in other dioceses as the number of full-time clergy positions have, have been reduced. The movement is toward a circle of leadership um, defined more by function and service and common purpose less than a hierarchical system of um, the ordained over the laity. So think of a circle rather than a pyramid. And we're still just beginning to live into that. So there's some pushing, you know, there's some attraction and repulsion about that for both clergy and laity. And I think some clergy have made that, um, I guess I would call it a emotional, mental, and spiritual leap to shared leadership, and others have not. Um, some lay people have taken their rightful place in that circle of leadership, and others have been reluctant to do so, or as some of you know in this room, been prevented from assuming a rightful role of leadership. Uh, because of various restraining forces. So I think that's part of what makes the religious landscape in which we live, um, not only in your own diocese, but in the whole church, really kind of interesting. And it's a, it's a transitional time. So the vocational, I guess what I would summarize, 
by saying is that the vocational landscape in which we live and move and have our being is complex and it's ambiguous and it's still evolving. So let's, let's jump to vocation. So if the landscape, if the religious landscape and, and the cultural and secular landscape is complex and challenging, it makes sense that our vocational lives as individuals, as clergy and lay people, would also face similar challenges. Now, I'm speaking from the perspective that every person in this room not only has a vocation, but has multiple vocations. I think one good shift that the church has made is we used to say, oh, she has a vocation to ordain ministry. Well, and we'd only say, we would only use the word vocation in relationship to ordination. We do that less and less, I think. Um, you know, everybody has multiple vocations. You know, for instance, I'm a priest, I'm a wife, I'm a parent, I'm the president of the House of Deputies. Um, <laughs> volunteer, by the way. Just wanna make sure you all know that. Somebody said, you don't really love the church very much. I said, are you kidding me? I spent Anyways, so, uh, we'll go with it. so I understand vocation as a role that God has called you to. Sometimes you're really happy to do it, and sometimes you're kicking and screaming. And God never calls us just once in a lifetime. God calls us over and over and over. Actually, sometimes that's really kind of annoying, you know? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm busy right now, thank you very much. So, what are some of your vocations? I just named some of mine. What are some of yours? Auxiliary board. Auxiliary board of what? The hospital. Of the hospital, okay. What else? Grandma. Grandma. I, I, I hope and pray, but I don't think it's going to happen for me. <laughs> what? I'm, I'm from St. Luke's across the pond, and I'm a um, hospice social worker. Okay. So, hospice social worker. Psychotherapist. Okay, psychotherapist. Data entry. All right. Data, data entry. Insurance agent. All right. Oh, you know, you've done it. You all have done a good job here because it's really hard to get some groups to actually have them say that their job is a vocation. It's really hard. It's like pulling teeth, but you're doing it. That's cool. What else? Musician. Hospice nurse. Hospice nurse. Musician. Priest and artist. Priest and artist. Editor. Editor. All right. Great. Okay, chair of the housing authority board. Hospice, boy, you got a lot of hospice people here going. Music in a lot of settings. Faculty wife. Faculty. Faculty wife. Faculty wife. Um, I'll talk to you later about that. So, <laughs> I'm a, rector's, I'm a rector's wife. I'm a, I forgot about that one. My husband's a, a rector of a parish, the same parish for 29 years. Talk about somebody who doesn't like change. <laughs> Feeding the hungry. Medical claims examiner. Translator. Translator. What do you translate? German to English theological. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Godmother, great aunt, junior warden. That is a calling from God because <laughs> I see we have a member of the religious. Yes? Vestry member. All right, you got it. You got it. So, um, The Irish priest and poet, John O'Donohue, anybody heard of him? Good. He wrote about vocation in a way that I find very compelling. Listen carefully, because I'm going to ask you in small groups to talk about this with one another. He wrote, the nature of the calling can change over time. So when he says calling, think about everything you just said, or focus on one. 
The nature of the calling can change over time. Taking a person down pathways never anticipated. The calling opens new territories within the heart. This in turn deepens the calling itself. The faces of the calling change. What at the beginning seemed simple and clear can become ambivalent and complex as it unfolds. To develop a heart that is generous and equal to this complexity is the continual challenge of growth. This is the creative tension that dwells at the heart of vocation. One is urged and coaxed beyond the pale regions into rich territories of risk and promise. And this comes from a great little book, which I recommend all the time. It's called To Bless the Space Between Us. And he's going to tweet it, probably, <laughs> um, by John O'Donohue. So what I want you to do, in groups of three or four, and just kind of move around, uh, take, let's take about 10 minutes and tell each other how your vocation has become more complex and perhaps more ambivalent as it's unfolded. And, and what are your territories of risk and promise? So tell each other how your vocation has become more complex and more ambivalent, you know, two feelings at the same time. And what are your territories of risk and promise. And I'm not going to make you share everything that you, you know, talk about. So um, go ahead for about 10 minutes and just have a conversation with each other. conversations but if I if I do that I won't get to the third part of this workshop um, if history is any indicator there will be oh, there will always be challenges in our vocational lives there will always be as John O'Donohue says territories of risk and promise if we're willing to go there and then the issue becomes how we manage and live into uh, those territories of risk and promise. So I want to talk a little bit about resilience. And we have a bunch of therapists and those types, so you can jump in if I say anything that's really wrong. <laughs> so, but let's talk a little, I want to talk a little bit about well-being and about stress and about resilience in light of our respective calls to be lay and ordained leaders. And uh, the first thing is I make the assumption that our spiritual leadership is Christ-centered, uh, that we're called to be leaders in this church, but we're called first and foremost to be disciples of Jesus. And secondly, I believe that when we're called to be leaders in the church, we commit ourselves to being healthy leaders and leading in a healthy way. And and. Frankly, one of my, um, the reason I think healthy religious spiritual leadership is so important is that too many gifted leaders in the church crash and burn when they don't care for themselves. Um, and the personal tragedy is bad enough, but the systemic cost to the congregation and the diocese and the church as a whole can, can be devastating, and perhaps some of you have experienced that. So a leader committed 
to his or her own health, promotes health in others and health within the community of the church. So I'm not gonna ask you to consider these right now, but tuck these away and, and perhaps take some time over the next couple weeks to think about this. How would you rate your own commitment to health and well-being? I know for me personally, it waxes and wanes. <laughs> I think that's probably the human condition. But, but then what I have to do is when it wanes, I have to think, what is it that is causing me to lose sight of the importance of my own health and well-being? The answer is different for everybody. And, and what that question leads to is, what are my vulnerabilities? What are the things that I do that make me vulnerable to, to not being a healthy leader? I, the last thing I would say is that spiritual leaders, lay and ordained, commit themselves to being lifelong learners. So the other thing you need to think about, or I hate it when I say you need to, but yeah, you do. All right. <laughs> is what have you needed, think about what have you needed to, to know in the past two years that you didn't know? And so therefore, what do you need to learn for the next two years? And I'm not saying that just to clergy. I'm saying that to uh, lay leaders as well. What, in order to be the best and healthiest spiritual leader, lay or ordained possible, what do you need to learn? What do you need to know? And then find ways to make that happen. So there's a Credo faculty member, a doctor, Bill Watson. And he always quoted, any, anybody know what a Bowflex is? Anybody have one? And they don't seem to be too popular anymore. They were they were always on TV, and you you know, there's some machine that would do everything. And I, I figured if I bought one and just put it in my living room, <laughs> that maybe it would, you know. But here are the instructions on the Bowflex. Do not leave tension on the equipment. It loses elasticity, memory and its ability to go back to its origin. I love those instructions. Because they're a metaphor for what happens to us when we are under chronic and unrelieved stress. So what are the impacts of chronic stress? You don't know? All right, so it's increased heart rate, high blood pressure, Yep, sleep disorders. De I couldn't hear you. Memory loss. Yes, memory, what? <laughs> it makes your cholesterol level go up. It makes your immune response go down. Um, and you know what's the most fascinating thing about chronic stress? Is it does DNA damage. There are these little things called telomeres. And the telomere is the end of the strand of DNA. And what happens is, as it becomes damaged, it begins to unravel. And so the, the toll of stress, our DNA literally becomes frazzled. And we know there's all kinds of stress-related illnesses, headaches, what else? Depression, cancer, hypertension, diabetes, autoimmune diseases. And stress will always be with us. I mean, it's not like, you know, if you don't have any stress, you're dead, right? So there are two kinds of stress. There's eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -E eustress, that's good stress, and distress. But everybody has heard of distress. Nobody's ever heard of eustress. Um, so, it's part of living, and so the issue is how we deal with it. And so the antidote to stress is, what's the title of my talk? Resilience, all right? And resilience is something you do more than something you have. You're not like born with resilience, um, even though I think children in many ways are more resilient than adults, but Resilience is something that you can do and increase. Um, and so what is resiliency? 
Uh, the easiest way to describe it is it's the ability to bounce back after something bad happens. Um, and it's really your ability to, to cope, to manage disruptive change. And if you are an Episcopalian, you have to, you have to manage change, right? Um, it's, um, resiliency is the ability to maintain an adequate level of good health when you're under stress or under constant pressure. Um, resiliency has to do with your ability to overcome or learn to live with adversity. And tragedy happens to each one of us. I thought I was immune. <laughs> because the first 50 years of my life were, frankly, easy as pie. And then in five years, <laughs> you know, let's see. My mother, my father, my daughter, my brother-in-law, both brother-in-laws, and a couple other relatives all died within a very few years. And I thought, how, how will I ever bounce back? I mean, all this talk about resiliency, you know, blah, 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 blah. How, how do, you know, so suddenly I was faced with what can I actually do so that I don't just kind of go into a corner? And so I started talking to some close friends and said, what do you do when you have, whether it's overwhelming loss in your personal life or you lose your job or you know, your church has a big fight or whatever it is in your life that is difficult and painful and stressful, what do you do to, um, maintain your, yourself and to still live an abundant life in Christ. Because let me tell you, you know as well as I do that your faith, my, my, my husband was, you know, he was one of those people where his faith became strengthened. Not so much me. I didn't go to church for six months. I just said, hey, wait, I, I got to think this through. Um, I, did, I did go back. Obviously. <laughs> I, I might have overdone it a little bit. <laughs> so, so, resilience isn't something extraordinary. It's ordinary. And it's, it's not a trait that you have or don't have. Everybody can be resilient. Because you learn and you develop ways to bounce back. So, I want to learn from you as much as I hope you might want to learn a little bit from me. How do you bounce back when you are faced with enormous change or stress or loss or grief? How, what helps you? Because you saying what helps you is going to help somebody else in this room. So how do you bounce back? Feel you don't try to not be feeling what you're feeling. Yeah, you know, if you, um, Stan will help me out here, the more you suppress your feelings, the more they bite you in the rear later on, right? Is that kind of a clinical way to put it? <laughs> Reaching out to others and talking. Okay, critical. If you, if you isolate yourself, which frankly I did for a while after my daughter died, I just kind of said, you know, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to explain what happened. I don't want to. And, and the longer I did that, the worse I got. So my husband finally kicked me and said, uh, you know, this isn't, you know, how, how's this working for you, Gay? Not so much. So your social support, your friends are critical. People who will listen to you tell the same story over and over and won't say, uh, uh, I've heard that before. If somebody says that to you, well, you know, you've already told me that. You need to move on to somebody else. What else? Yes. Breath. Number one, I'm Breath. I'm sorry. Breath. I couldn't. Put Prayer. 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 Okay. Absolutely. You know that our, this is called the, the um, workshop is called I Will With God's Help, which is the phrase from where? 
the baptismal covenant, right? And there's a whole list of things in the baptismal covenant which I think are a recipe for resilience. <coughs> and I didn't think of that until Bishop Tom said, he, didn't, he frankly didn't like my first title of my workshop. So he said, how about I will with God's help? And I thought, okay. Mm. And then I started thinking about, so thank you. Mm. And um, I started thinking about it and I started reading the baptismal covenant. And I said, good grief, he's exactly right. Because listen to this. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship? In other words, will you listen to your ancestors and their wisdom and fellowship? Will you be with people in the breaking of the bread, receiving the Eucharist, and in the prayers? Uh, there's all kinds of studies, clinical studies about, you know, what gratitude does and forgiveness and prayer and you know there's more life satisfaction the fact is it does help you bounce back in times of stress when you here's another one when you persevere in resisting evil and you fall into sin repent and return to the Lord I will with God's help confession is good for the soul and it's good for your psychological and emotional and spiritual and physical well-being Will you proclaim by word and example the good news? Will you serve others? And when we get outside of ourselves, see, that, that first six months, I was just inside myself. I was, I had a really, it was, for a little while, it was, um, I would just call it a, a, one of Gay's greatest pity parties. <laughs> and once I, I knew that I couldn't, I couldn't manage that loss by myself, when I said, I, I really need to be with other people, everything changed. Everything changed. So what else? What, what else helps you? I, I journaled. Uh, journal. I lost different people, and I found that writing my feelings down helped me get them out. I, mean, I might cry all over the book while I was writing, but it but came it, out and I felt But it's cathartic. So for some people, writing and seeing it in print makes a huge difference. What else works for you? In my experience, at least, there's no balance. There is only the deliberate, daily, sometimes, well, generally, often, hourly struggle of the will. No balancing. And, and never underestimate the power of our own wills. I, I think there are several things just to go with prayer. Um, when I'm in the most stress, I ask other people to pray for me because I may not be able to make the connection myself. And so the other piece is hard work, scrubbing a floor, cleaning a refrigerator out, those kinds of things that are, or making a cup of tea. When somebody, um, when I actually told a friend I was having trouble praying, he said, that's right, I'll pray for you for a while. I'm going to do that for you for a while. And I'll get back to you in a month. And within that month, when he came back to me and prayed with me, I was able to start praying again. So that offer to pray for someone is, you can't imagine how powerful that actually can be. Somebody up here with me. I have to get out into the woods or to the ocean or to connect with nature somehow and I do need my solitude. I can only handle people so much and then I need to be alone. <laughs> right, absolutely. So you, you have to work to be aware of what works for you because for some of us who are kind of like raging extroverts, you know, that solitude thing, whenever I go on a quiet retreat, I just sleep. And <laughs> So, but I do need solitude, but some people need it more than others. And I just, uh, I think learning to breathe is really important. Breathe. Breathing. <laughs> Meditating. Mm -hmm. um, having a practice where you can uh, learn to breathe better. You know, some people do yoga or Tai Chi or things like that. I think that's important to move the body yep. and to take some time for yourself working like yep. that. You use the word practice. What happens to people when 
they are faced with something overwhelming is they tend to drop their practices. Their spiritual practices, their physical exercise practices, their eating practices. It's the worst possible time to do that. And so, but we're also not cognitively in good enough shape sometimes to be aware of that. So don't be afraid to help a friend to say, so, are you still exercising? Because nobody's mentioned physical exercise. You've got to get those endorphins going. So, Anne. I was actually going to say exercise. Yay! <laughs> but the other thing is, um, is, and I'm talking particularly about grief, is don't compare yourself to somebody else's journey in grief because we all do it differently. Right, everybody is different. And, and, and those are, many of you work in hospice and you know that. Um, but we do kind of have judgments about how we think people ought to be moving along the, uh, the, gr the road of grief and people navigate it differently. Um, I was in hospice, I worked for just a short time in that and I learned from that to be much more comfortable asking people how they're doing with their grief. So I asked a friend of ours who lost her husband quite early, really, and I said, how are you doing with that? She said, well, I've learned to make it part of myself. Uh, somebody told me to make it part of myself, and I thought that was, I'm still thinking about that, but uh, I thought that was a good model because when you talk about stress, it's these things that are coming after you and diminishing you and so forth, but that's a model with much more integrity and maybe long-lasting uh, satisfaction. And, and I want to say something about grief. Grief is not just about losing a person you love. It could be losing a job you love. It could be losing a standing in the community. It could be, you know, a lot of people who retire, there's a, there's a significant grief reaction. So um, we all experience a lot of little deaths over our lifetime, and some we manage better than others. I saw a lot of hands up. Go ahead. Uh, I take a time out. Uh, when I have to cope with something, I, I uh, give myself some space. I call it going on a drunk, and what I mean is that I read an entire murder mystery. <laughs> and and, and I, I thought it would be really funny for me to be saying this while I'm, all of you are talking <laughs> about prayer. <laughs> but I never face anything the day that I know about it. I know that I just need to back off and get into unreality, and, and then I then the next day I can face it, but not immediately. Stan, there's a couple in the back have been, had a chance. Okay. <laughs> this sounds nutty, but interact with a pet. Mm -hmm. Animal. Now that, that forces you, usually if it's like a dog, you have to get exercise. Right. Because that dog needs to be walked. That's right. <laughs> And there is clinical evidence that shows that interacting with an animal is, in fact, self-healing. Yep. Yeah, I'm not going to say anything about that. I find in these major transitions, there's, you know, there's always a re-examination of, of a self-concept. And, you know, so who am I anyway if I'm not this person's daughter, if I'm not this job anymore, you know, that professionally? So for me, getting back in touch with the things that have brought me joy, that have helped shape my sense of myself for many years, you know, certain music, uh, you know, beloved movie that I may already know by heart and I've seen 35 times, but it's okay because it's a form of self-soothing that doesn't involve carbohydrates. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also reminding me I'm still me, regardless of the changes in whatever the circumstance may be. Those two in the last row, and that, then I've got to move on, so to speak. Yeah, I think the key phrase is, I am not the only one. I think there's a lot of other people out there. And I, I said, what, what, what would be my good wishes for them? Then I listened to those words and said, oh, I could pay Thank attention you. to those myself. Yep. Did it? Th there are... Is anybody else? There's more. There's one. 
No, I was a chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> chocolate. Chocolate's a vegetable, you know, and you need to eat your vegetables. Oh. Uh, change the ordination vows so that they, we promise to do this with God's help. <laughs> it's crazy. They make you say this. And, uh, are you kidding me? <laughs> Thank you all. Um, you know, the thing about stress is that it's cumulative. And it sneaks up on you. And so finding ways to manage stress and increase your resilience are, um, uh, I think, part of what it means to be a healthy leader. And we've talked about a lot of the ways that we can do that. Thank you for, for sharing all these many ways because I don't know about you, but I heard a couple of things. I thought, oh, I haven't thought of that. And so uh, doing that within a community is a great thing to do. Um, this is, I think, about our time, unless you have any comments or questions for me. I'd be glad to try to answer. We have about five minutes. Anything that jumped out at you during this hour or so? Jay, you know, I've uh, often joked uh, uh, don't let stress kill you. The church can help. Uh, and I've got a new twist on that by virtue of, of the church just now helping us each think about how we deal with stress. So it is true that the church can help. So who had something for you? Oh, I didn't get to the gym this morning, so this is good for me. <laughs> it kind of reminds me about, remember Phil Donahue kind of running up the... Cool. So I'm Michelle I'm from Saranac Lake as well. Um, I, I just thank you for everything you've said. I wanted to say earlier, Bishop Love said Vermonters are kind of modest. They don't want to toot their own horn. But I can tell you that your mission has reached us. And we come here and we feel celebrated. And, you know, we celebrate it with Bishop Ely at home. And you're doing it. So there's your toot. Because everything that you're doing is working. And I think at the end when we talk about, you know, what do we do to help ourselves? And the community is not being afraid to say, you're kind of messed up. You need to come with me. And not be afraid to have her yell and have her hurt and have her express that. But love her anyway, in an active way. And that's, you know, when you're in it, you can't think of what we discussed here, which is how to help yourself. And community is about that reach out. Exactly. And, and dragging them, kicking and screaming if needed. You know, you said your husband kicked you out the door. Woo <laughs> You know, and, and in afterthought, in hindsight, could he have done it sooner? Who knows? Whatever. It takes what it takes. But well, I still had a job, so I actually went to work. But it was... <laughs> but I, I want to say but, thank you, and, and thank you exactly. um, all, because you your mission has reached us. And, you know, I look at my thing and it says, yes, and I'm churched. I'm the senior warden. My junior warden is over here. And, and it matters what you do every day. And so coming to a convention and being refreshed, and hearing an outsider say thank you, um, let that settle because it means something to us to be here. And I know for Essex and, and all of us, thank you. That's great. Th thank you for that. Um, when, when we are truly the community, it's amazing what we do for one another, and sometimes we're, we're not even aware of it. So thank you for, for saying that. Hi, Gay. Hello. I wanted to thank you so much for your wonderful presence and for your ministry in the church. Thank you. And we uh, thank you so much and send you a lot of thank love you. from Vermont. Thank you, thank you. I spent every summer in Vermont as a young, from ages 8 to 16, at Camp Songadewan of Kuwait and on the shores of Lake Willoughby in the Northeast Kingdom. Mm. It really did form me. And I'll say more about that tonight or sometime. <laughs> I'm only talking five times while I'm here. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all very much. So let's thank Gabe very much.